This Week on Mortgage and Company. TPP, the big story you haven't heard about. There'd be no reason to keep it so secret if it wasn't in the interest of the public. This really is a deal that's being negotiated by corporations for corporations, and any benefit it provides to the bulk of the populations of this country will be purely incidental. And drone warfare, deadly fire from the sky. Funding is provided by Carnegie Corporation of New York, celebrating 100 years of philanthropy and committed to doing real and permanent good in the world. The Kohlberg Foundation, Independent Production Fund, with support from the Partridge Foundation, a John and Polly Guth charitable fund. The Clements Foundation, Park Foundation, dedicated to heightening public awareness of critical issues. The Herb Alpert Foundation, supporting organizations whose mission is to promote compassion and creativity in our society. The Bernard and Audrey Rappaport Foundation. The John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, committed to building a more just, verdant, and peaceful world. More information at macfound.org. Ann Gumowitz. The Betsy and Jesse Fink Foundation. The HKH Foundation. Barbara G. Fleischman. And by our sole corporate sponsor, Mutual of America, designing customized individual and group retirement products. That's why we're your retirement company. Welcome. The Disposition Matrix. Sounds like the title of a suspense thriller. But that's what America's counterterrorism experts call their database, the list of those our government believes are preparing to do America harm. From it, targets are chosen for assassination. However, the drones they use are not always so selective and often kill innocent civilians, including children. Last Tuesday, for the first time, drone attack victims testified at a briefing for members of Congress. Five members showed up. The briefing coincided with the release of a new documentary, Unmanned, America's Drone Wars, the latest from Brave New Films produced and directed by Robert Greenwald. It tells the story of civilians who have lost their lives to drones and includes the testimony of others, among them Brandon Bryant, a former American drone operator who carried out attacks by remote control from a military base in New Mexico. Getting into the drone program was weird. The introduction is like, this is what we do. We kill people and break things. That is what our job is. And depending on atmospherics, if it was a completely clear day, you would definitely get a good picture. And depending on how close you were, you could probably read the license plate on someone's car. We can see something as simple as people playing a soccer game. We can see individual players, and we can even see the ball. One of those featured in the film is Tariq Aziz, 16 years old. He lived in the mountainous region of northern Pakistan, and he loved to play soccer. In April 2010, his 18-year-old cousin, Osmar Ullah, was killed by a missile fired from an American drone as he rode his motorcycle. A year and a half later, Tariq, determined to tell his cousin's story, made a tough, day-long journey through treacherous terrain to attend a gathering in the capital of Islamabad, where tribal elders met with Western journalists to describe the drone war being waged in their homeland by the United States. This is a part of the drone missile that was used to kill that child. It was a gathering to get the voice of the victims of drone attacks out to the general public as well as the rest of the world. And that was the main goal. We were going to use the media to try and establish who had been killed and also why, where, and how. Well, because of the inaccessibility of, of Waziristan, it's very, very hard to compile any kind of credible evidence or evidence that other people will see as credible. That was part of the reason we organized this conference in Islamabad. We called it a jirga. A jirga is a traditional tribal gathering. That's what people in that area use to settle their disputes. <laughs> At one stage, I came across a young boy, Tariq Aziz. When I was talking to Tariq, 
one of the first things that he did was he handed me his cousin's student ID card. And as I looked at it, I looked back at Tariq and I noticed that he was crying. He started to tell me the story of his cousin who had been killed from a drone strike. He'd come to the Joga primarily to inform us a little bit more about what had happened to his cousin, to people in his local village, and find out how to stop the killing. And we sat together all day. We ate together at lunchtime. We laughed together. We became friends. Tariq was extremely intelligent and funny to be around. He had a nice sense of humor. He was fascinated by photography and intrigued by Western music mentioning artists and one that sprang to mind was Lady Gaga. He started to talk about drone strikes in his village. How he was unable to sleep at night. He was scared. He was worried about his family, his friends. Tariq was traumatized. And the people who were gathered there adopted a resolution condemning the strikes. Then we went together to a rally, and Tariq Aziz traveled there with us. Thousands of Pakistanis came to support a giant rally on Sunday. The protest against the United States drone attack in Pakistan. People from all over the country, irrespective of their ages and backgrounds, came together to the rally. Tariq Aziz and the other attendees returned to their homes. Three days later, Tariq and another cousin, 12-year-old Wahid Khan, were driving to pick up players for a soccer match. In a flash, both young people were killed by a CIA drone strike car destroyed, their bodies badly burned. Two days later, I got a call. I got an email. How's that work when we found out? We got out? an email and a telephone call. Four days after the Jirga, I received an email from Shazad. The email simply said Tariq as the heading, and I opened it instantly. To my shock, I found out that Tariq had been murdered by a drone strike. And that was a shock. I, mean, I was like, how, how is it possible? What, where was he? What was he doing? And it's like completely unbelievable. If the U.S. had any information that Tarek Aziz was part of a criminal organization, was planning to carry out attacks on the United States, then our federal law enforcement agents should have been working with the authorities of Pakistan to arrest him. And one really has to ask the question why the government was not able to arrest or even question him. This is Islamabad we're talking about. It's the capital of the country. The population is over a million people. Jirga was a real public event. It was at a big hotel. It was advertised widely. It was an open event. Tarek Aziz was plainly visible to hundreds and hundreds of people. He talked with reporters. Everything about him that the authorities could have wanted to know about his location and about his recent activities were known to the United States. So it would have been extremely easy for them to approach him, sit down and talk to him, or for that matter, put him in jail. But instead, the CIA chose to go and kill him without giving him the opportunity to give his side of whatever it is that they thought that he had done. There is no evidence there whatsoever. And they've given him no lawyers, there is no judge, and there's no jury. Our preference is always to capture if we can, because we can gather intelligence. Uh, but a lot of the terrorist networks that 
target the United States, the most dangerous ones, uh, operate in very remote regions, and it's very difficult to capture them. But what we can discern from the pattern of strikes is that essentially Pakistan's been declared a no-capture zone um, that automatically uh, capture is not considered feasible. If you just look at the numbers, uh, there have been dramatically more people killed in recent years that have been captured. There are no CIA agents in Waziristan, so they rely on local people. And this is where the fundamental wrong is, because these people are working for you for money. And that reliance is utterly misplaced. And what you see in Tarek's case, and, and it just pains me to say this, that you know without any real room for dispute that there was someone in that room when we were having our jerga who was an informant uh, for the US intelligence services, and that that person picked out Tarek. I can tell you as a matter of fact that Tarek was not an extremist. And the way you know what intelligence they relied on to kill someone is what they release immediately after the killing. And in that case, they said four militants were killed. And of course, we know that two kids were killed. Um, that's how it happened. I asked the CIA about the strike, and their response was, on that day, no child was killed. In fact, the adult males were supporting al-Qaeda's facilitation network. So despite all of these technological assets and human assets, um, we're not there. We don't know. And I think there is a lot of room for error. You can see Robert Greenwald's film in its entirety at the website unmanned.warcost.com. I urge you to watch it with a companion because you will want to talk about the questions it raises concerning national security, drones, and the nature of war. Then I'd like to know what you think. Remember that in the excerpt we showed earlier, the former drone operator says, this is what we do. We kill people and break things. This is what our job is. It's true. Once we insist on war as a solution, this is always the outcome. There is no way to avoid killing the innocent when you've determined to destroy your enemy. Our own government has fought our wars by dropping atomic bombs on whole cities, by firebombing, carpet bombing, by spreading the poison of Agent Orange over the homes and farms of non-combatants, by splashing burning napalm on children. In this war on terror, we're told, either we put boots on the ground and see our own young men and women killed, or we put drones in the sky firing missiles at strangers who can be seen only from a distance. If you were President Obama, what choice would you make? I'd like to hear your succinct and considered response. Write me at filmwarriors.com or on Facebook. I promise to read every response. Let's turn now to another big story most of us know even less about than drones, TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership. It's a trade agreement the United States is negotiating with Australia, Canada, Japan, and eight other countries in the Pacific region. If you don't know about the TPP, and few do, it's because the powerful people behind it, including President Obama, don't want you to know. The negotiations are shrouded in secrecy, and once they're completed, Obama wants to rush the agreement through Congress, fast-tracking, they call it, with our elected representatives given the choice only of voting it up or down. Last year, over 130 members of Congress asked the White House for more transparency about what's been negotiated, and were essentially told to go fly a kite. You can be sure of this, however. A select group of corporate partners, companies like General Electric, Goldman Sachs, and Pfizer, the pharmaceutical giant, are not likely to be in the dark. Players like these stand to be the real beneficiaries of the agreement because like other so-called free trade agreements, TPP actually will reward those at the top, even as it creates rules that will override domestic laws on the environment, workplace safety, and investment. Corporate lobbyists already are lining up in Washington to ram the agreement through once the White House hurries it out of the delivery room. How do we know this? 
because some vigilant independent watchdogs are tracking the negotiations with sources they trust, and two are with me now. Eve Smith is an expert on investment banking and the founder of Aurora Advisors, a New York-based management consulting firm. She runs the Naked Capitalism blog, a go-to site for information and insight on the business and ethics of finance. Dean Baker is co-director of the Progressive Center for Economic and Policy Research in Washington, D.C. He's been a senior economist at the Economic Policy Institute and a consultant to Congress and the World Bank. I rarely miss his blog, Beat the Press, and I'm a regular reader of his column in the Guardian newspaper. Welcome to you both. Thanks for being here. Twelve nations are involved in negotiating this treaty, and so far, hardly a peep or leak from inside. Why so much secrecy? Well, it's a very strange procedure here. Essentially, what you've done is you've parceled out chunks of the agreement. So you have an agreement, a portion of it dealing with prescription drugs. You have a portion dealing with the Internet. You have portions of it dealing with various aspects of environmental regulations. And you only have those parties to the table that are directly involved. When I'm saying directly involved, essentially the industry groups. So it's not as though we brought the environmentalists there to talk about what sort of environmental regulation we want around fracking. You have the industry groups, the oil and gas industry, they're sitting down there with their counterparts in the other countries deciding what sort of regulations you'll have on fracking. So it's a very peculiar way to go about doing a treaty, and I think if there were more public knowledge of it, people would be very unhappy. It's very peculiar to have this, you know, a, an agreement of this importance be kept so much under wraps. You know, the, one of the things that is known is apparently only five of, of the 29 chapters actually have anything to do with trade. So really, it's a mistake to call it a trade agreement. This is really an agreement that's purpose is substantially to weaken nation-based regulation while at the same time strengthening intellectual property protections. So it's basically a gimme to companies on both ends. Well, if there is so much secrecy, how do we know what we don't know, to paraphrase Donald Rumsfeld? I mean, there have been some leaks from people involved in the process, so there have been bits and pieces that have come out. Um, but it, it's very difficult to really know what is in there. They give limited access to members of Congress, and this, again, you know, he's just making a comment about that. You know, this really, to my mind, is quite a scandal. So even a member of Congress, our elected representatives, can't just go in there and say, let me see, you know, where this stands, where the latest text is. They can get limited access to parts of it. They can't bring their staff in, and they're basically sworn to secrecy. Some people have seen pieces. One of the groups that's been very on top of this has been a Washington, D.C. group called Public Citizen. And from the pieces they've been able to put together, they see that it, for example, will allow drug companies to increase prices, to extend their intellect, the term of their patent, so the patent protection will go longer, it'll be much longer before anything will become generic. Um, it would restrict uh, buying local of all sorts. So, for example, governments would not be able to, you know, say we're only going to be able to buy from people in state or people in the U.S. Uh, it would it would make things like GMO labeling impermissible. It would weaken environmental regulations. First, for example, you couldn't you couldn't say, gee, you know, Chinese tilapia. We don't want to import that anymore because it's become too toxic. You that that kind of restriction would not be permissible. Yeah, let me carry that even a step further with the prescription drugs, just to try and put some dollars and cents on that. We spend around 300 billion a year on prescription drugs. Without patent and other similar protection, we'd be spending about 30 billion. So this is, you know, how much we're paying extra for prescription drugs because we have patent related protections. Now, you could imagine a trade agreement, if this were really about trade, we'd be going, how can we bring those prices down? But instead, what you have is the drug companies there, and they're not talking about how to bring them down. They're talking about how to bring them up, primarily in other countries, but they'd like to bring them up in the United States as well. Is that free trade? It's the opposite. That's patent laws are patent laws, free trade? It's a protection, and that's what right. I just find yeah. so amazing. It's called patent protection. And then they're going, that's free trade. And go, no, this is a government-granted monopoly. And that just speaks to you know, how convoluted our language has become, that it's not free trade if we don't extend a government-granted monopoly long into the future. Doesn't the entertainment industry also stand to gain? Yes. I mean, one of the things that, that there's a European counterpart of the Trans-Pacific Partnership that's also in a negotiation. One of the things that France is upset about is that they provide subsidies to their entertainment industry. The idea that a French film that would only appear in an art house cinema is any threat to <laughs> the American movie industry, I mean, that's absurd. And yet that kind of thing would not be permissible under that, under that version of the deal. Um, what happens, one of the things that would happen apparently under both deals is even more severe restrictions on copying and transfers um, to the point where one of the uh, 
leading one, an internet group called the Electronic Frontier Foundation said it would even interfere with the basic operation of the internet because things like temporary copies wouldn't be permitted under this rule. But also there's an issue of enforcement here that people might remember the Stop Online Piracy Act that they were trying to get through in the United States a couple years ago. And of course there was a big uprising against a lot of grassroots opposition. A lot of companies in fact came out in opposition to it. And one of the big points there was that it required third parties. So someone posted something on my website that turned out to violate a copyright of Warner Brothers. Well under that I could be held liable for this. Warner Brothers could take action, legal action against me. As it stands now, if I have material that violates their copyright, it's incumbent on Warner Brothers to go, oh, you have to take this down, and then I have you know, a reasonable time period to take it down. So is this why you wrote the other day, this could make Google, Facebook, and indeed anyone with a website into a copyright cop? Exactly. But th this is the paradox to me. I mean, as you've just said, stronger copyright and patent protection is the very opposite of free trade. Uh, they involve government um, interference, intervention in the market. They restrict competition. They lead, as you've just said, to higher prices for consumers. How can you describe this as a free trade agreement? I think the free trade idea is what's being used to bully a lot of the countries into it, that if you're not part of this deal, you'll somehow be left on the outside. You know, for example, there's a big argument apparently in Japan about this right now, that, that Japan is one of the late joiners to the negotiations. And some groups in Japan have started objecting, and the government's saying, well, if we don't participate, you know, everybody else will be in and we'll be out. So that's, that's the leverage that America's apparently using to try to get people on board. But it's really important to point out it is in free trade. You know, if you look at the actual trade barriers that exist between the United States and these other countries, at this point they're almost all very small. You know, if you have a tariff of one or two percent, you know, things like that, it really doesn't matter whether it's there or it's zero. So what this is really about is, you know, these sorts of, in many cases, provisions increasing barriers or restricting the ability to have environmental regulations, health and safety regulations. That's what's really about. Trade's really peripheral. That's how this works in combination with the secrecy provision. It's free trade because nobody knows otherwise. Mm -hmm. What is your greatest concern about this? I think the drugs one is my biggest one. The second one, frankly, is financial services because this would, this would also basically make a lot of financial services regulation that we now have pretty much impossible. It would force, it would force everything. Well, free, apparently financial services is one of the chapters. And so again, it would lead to a race to the bottom that any country, that any signatory to the pact could say, gee, your you know, XYZ country has weaker regulations you know, you're, you're hurting us by making us adhere to this higher standard. And in particular, and another sort of interesting conflict, is that one of the things that it rules out is capital controls. Now, historically, people used to say that, you know, again, it was sort of a simple-minded idea that capital controls weren't such a good thing. And now the IMF has come around and has said that capital controls, you know, certain types are actually desirable. Um, Chile and Malaysia had them both going into the crisis, and they did better than a lot of other countries as a result of having them. Um, and so, but that, in fact, may be one of the things that, that makes this deal founder, that some of the countries that have them and like them are objecting to the fact that these are included in the pact. Is it conceivable to you that this could affect the enforcement of Dodd-Frank, which was ostensibly uh, passed to prevent another great crash like 2008? Could this affect the enforcement of Dodd-Frank? Yeah, no, I mean, certainly the derivatives regulation, and I would expect the capital levels. There's no how? how would that work? The first language in both these deals goes something along the lines with all signatories are required to make their laws and regulations conform to the standards of this agreement. They are literally required to make their nation-based laws subordinate to the terms of these agreements. And again, we don't know exactly what's in them, but the whole notion is that they are to permit very liberalized capital flows and minimal restrictions. So Dodd-Frank basically is consistent with that. So foreign trade partners would conceivably be allowed to uh, challenge American laws? Yeah. That's exactly That's the point. That's the point. I mean, it, one of the things it extends is a concept that exists in, the, in NAFTA, but is, um, which is that you have special panels that companies can go to to get matters adjudicated if they believe that regulations have led them to lose profit. And it's not even necessarily that they've currently lost profit, it's that they have potentially lost profit. For example, one case that's now pending under NAFTA is that Quebec has an anti-fracking prohibition to protect the St. Lawrence River Valley. There's a U.S. company that's suing $250 million. And if they win, if they win that case before the special panel, the Quebec government will have to pay that amount. 
under the TPP, you'll see an enormous expansion of that kind of power. Both of you are good at arguing the other side for the purposes of debate. So what's good about this? I mean, what, what, what's, why should anybody be for this? free trade agreement that's not a free trade agreement. Yeah, I, it, it is really hard for me to see. I mean, I'm sure if we had the whole text in front of us, I'm sure I, you know, both of us would be able to find things we go, that good, that good. I mean, there has to be something that's good. But, you know, the way it's being constructed, it's not the way in which you design a treaty that's intended to benefit the bulk of the population of either the United States or the other countries. I mean, you, you, you wouldn't just have the corporate interest there, and that's literally what you've done. I mean, it is kind of amazing. What are they going to do? They're going to try to ensure that the, it maximizes their profits. Now, not everything they have there is going to be bad, but I suspect most of the clauses in there are going to be to advance their interests. One of the aspects of the, of the Trans-Pacific Partnership is it's an everyone but China deal. One of the intentions of the deal is to isolate China. Um, so if you think isolating China is a good thing, then that would be a reason to support the deal. Now, in fact, ironically, a lot of the companies that are supporting this deal may not have thought through all the implications because a lot of them have extended supply chains that go through China. If this disrupts their current supply chains, they might actually have to reorganize their lives a bit more than they had thought. Our economies are very integrated. Yeah. One would expect that they'll continue to be integrated. You know, so the idea that we're going to isolate them, I don't really see how that would work in any case. But if that were a goal of policy, if we actually could get to a situation where we did sort of separate the countries, um, that would not be a pretty picture. So I think we have to look to integrate with them and ideally on better terms than we currently have. Some people refer to this Pacific deal as the quote, North American free trade agreement on steroids. Does that make sense to you? Well, it does because the North American trade agreement in the end um, wound up helping corporations and didn't do much for American workers. In fact, there have been economists who said that NAFTA produced as much as one, nearly a million uh, job losses in the U.S. And the whole notion of this agreement is to facilitate the movement of capital and to give capital privilege, even more privileges than it has now. Um, so, you know, workers, except for a few who have a seat at the table like the UAW, workers are basically in the back of the bus on this one. President Clinton promised a lot with NAFTA. Listen to this. NAFTA will tear down trade barriers between our three nations. It will create the world's largest trade zone and create 200,000 jobs in this country by 1995 alone. The environmental and labor side agreements negotiated by our administration will make this agreement a force for social progress as well as economic growth. Did NAFTA bring us hundreds of thousands of jobs? Did we get better environmental and labor standards? What did we get? You'd be very hard pressed to see us having gotten jobs from NAFTA. I mean, you had a number of companies you could identify that shift operations to Mexico. And that was clearly a main point of the agreement because there's extensive chapters on investment. And much of the agreement was about making it easy for, say, a General Electric, General Motors to shift their operations to Mexico and know that they would be guaranteed that there wouldn't be an issue of expropriation. They wouldn't have to worry about repatriating their profits. That was really a point of the agreement. So we did lose a lot of jobs to Mexico for that reason. Um, in terms of the environmental and uh, labor standards, those were thrown in as an afterthought. Now, you've had had some effort to take advantage of those. I, I wouldn't really say it's had much impact. I mean, basically, to help the situation of some uh, unions in Mexico or workers trying to organize unions in Mexico. But those really were an afterthought, and they weren't intended. It's, it's the way it's always treated. The investment stuff is serious. You don't play games with it. The labor stuff is like, oh, okay, you could talk about it. There's no real enforcement mechanism. No one's going to go to court and pay hundreds of millions of dollars in damage because they didn't comply with the terms of the labor conditions. Same with the environment, right? Exactly. There's nothing. And, and it's not that we couldn't put terms in. I mean, these are all intelligent people. If we wanted to put in terms with that agreement that had enforceable environmental standards, they would be there. And then if you had a situation where a company was breaking those standards, they would be paying very serious damages. That has not happened because of NAFTA. Ross Perot, whom, as you both know, ran as a third-party candidate in 1992 against George H.W. Bush and Bill Clinton, warned us against NAFTA. Listen to this. If you're paying $12, $13, $14 an hour for factory workers, and you can move your factory south of the border, pay a dollar an hour for labor, hire a young 25, let's assume you've been in business for a long time, you've got a mature workforce. Pay a dollar an hour for your labor, have no health care, that's the most expensive single element, making a car, have no environmental controls, no pollution controls, and no retirement, and you don't care about anything but making money, there will be a giant sucking sound going south. He was prophetic. Yeah. Well, and the, and the funny bit about his, his math is that actually 
one of the things which is distressing, and apparently this is actually worse than the TPP, but, but the companies have tended to move production even when the economic case was very weak. And so when that happens, what you're really seeing is a transfer from late. You're not really seeing shareholders benefit. You're basically seeing a transfer from factory labor to the top executives, that, that, you're, that you're cutting their pay. I mean, there's, there are industries like furniture. I mean, when you think about it, you've got U.S. wood and you're shipping it to China and then shipping it back. You know, a lot of the values in that wood, you lose a lot in the transit time. You also lose a lot in flexibility. And people in, 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 in industries where you've got a lot of U.S. content in things that are shipped overseas and then, and then sent back, and they've said the, ca the economic case just isn't very strong, but we did it because our stock would get a pop from During the 2008 campaign, candidate Obama uh, was skeptical about NAFTA. Here's what he said then. Scrap NAFTA, Senator Obama, or fix it. Uh, I would immediately uh, call the, the president of Mexico, the president of Canada, to try to amend NAFTA because I think that we can get labor agreements in that uh, agreement right now. And it should reflect the basic principle that our trade agreements should not just be good for Wall Street, it should also be good for Main Street. And the problem that we've had is, is that we've had corporate lobbyists oftentimes involved in negotiating these trade agreements, but the AFL-CIO hasn't been involved. Ordinary working people have not been involved. And we've got to make sure that our agreements are good for everybody because globalization right now is creating uh, winners and losers. But the problem is it's the same winners and the same losers each and every time. What do you suppose is the influence on President Obama that caused him to reverse course on NAFTA and not fulfill what was a campaign pledge? Well, I think it's the nature of politics in the United States. I mean, it's not a secret. You know, you have very powerful p politically, economically uh, people who, you know, are pushing for this. And, you know, we saw this with Wall Street, you know, when President Obama first came into office. You know, at that point, you know, Wall Street is on its back, meaning the financial industry. And basically, President Obama had it in his ability to break up the big banks, totally restructure finance. He decided not to go that route, and his top advisors, well, Robert Rubin, clearly had an enormous role, you know, was the yeah. uh, top executive at Citigroup and formerly Goldman Sachs. He was not going to go that route because these were the people he was listening to, and I think that's continued to be the pattern throughout his administration, that he's listening to people, the corporate interest he was just talking about there. Those are the people who are steering the policy. I mean, I'd go a little bit further than Dean on that, in that, in that when you look at Obama's record of his campaign promises versus what he's actually done, there's sort of a normal acceptable level of political lying, and Obama has gone way past what is historically been normal in terms of, you know, politicians fudging and then doing something else when they've been in office. This is just another example. Do you buy Dean's argument that it is the power of Wall Street, that it is? I, th I think Obama is fundamentally a very conservative person. The idea that he, uh, he ran as the anti-Bush because the country was desperate for somebody other than Bush, so he sold what would sell. He's liberal on social issues, but economically, he's, he's not very different than the Republicans. This discussion brings me to the economy. As you both know, the September jobs report, which was delayed by the government uh, shutdown, was weak by all reports. What is it going to take to turn our economy around for working people and middle class people out there who really are in pain? Well, we clearly need much more rapid growth, and it's just not on the agenda. And it's sort of like, you know, they're, they're, they seem to be hoping, when I'm saying they, people in Washington, including the Obama administration, somehow something's just going to jump out of nowhere, and the economy doesn't work that way. So, you know, if we're going to see more rapid growth, you know, it's fairly narrow places it has to come from. You know, are we going to see some surge in consumption? Very hard to see. Is there going to be a surge in investment? You know, very hard to see. Basically, the government's the one entity that has the ability to boost the economy. By spending money. By spending money. Larger deficits. You know, that's, that's what it boils down to. And that's, you know, you cannot say that. I mean, I've talked to people in the administration, talked to people in Congress. They go, oh, I'll get killed if I say that. Well, someone's got to say it because that happens to be true. Do you believe it? Absolutely. I mean, if you want to look at the economy in a very simple way, you've, we'll just get rid of the import-export sector because for the U.S. this won't change the story. You've got households. You've got the government. You've got businesses. Households tend to be net savers because people save for retirement and emergencies. Uh, businesses, we like to think of as businesses being net borrowers because businesses invest and spend. And then, therefore, the notion is the reason that a lot of people are opposed to government running deficits is that they're afraid that the government will borrow and crowd out business investment. Um, the fact is that businesses, even in the last expansion under Bush, 
we're net saving, which is, so basically capitalists aren't acting like capitalists anymore. <laughs> they've gotten so short-term oriented. And in a weak economy, they, you know, they've got, they pull in their horns, they don't spend a lot, they don't, they don't invest then either. And now, now we've got companies literally borrowing hundreds of billions of dollars. They've got records levels of cash. And what are they doing? They're buying back stock. So this is actually the time government should be running deficits, and yet it's anathema to say it politically. Why is that? I mean, it seems to me the other side has won the argument. Well, they've won it politically. What's striking is they've lost it completely in academic economics. This is an active area of economic research. At this point, there's been literally dozens of papers produced that show if we want to see growth in the economy today, the government's going to have to run larger deficits. So, so the opponents of big deficits say, no, that's going to undermine business confidence. So whatever the government does by way of increasing spending, we're going to undermine business confidence or about consumer confidence, so that will offset it. People have studied this, and you know, including the International Monetary Fund, which I right. mentioned here, because not so much as they're just authoritative, but they tend to be conservative. You'd expect them to typically be on the opposite side of this. They've produced a number of papers showing that, no, the current context, bigger deficits will lead to more growth, more jobs. But politically, you can't say that. And I will, I will disagree with Eves on this because I do think trade actually could be part of this story, but here again, they can't talk about that. If you go to someone in the administration, to my view, if you want to see an improved trade balance, get the dollar down. Very simple. A lower value dollar means our goods are cheaper elsewhere in the world. Imports are more expensive to people in the United States, so we buy more domestically produced goods, fewer imports. Exchange policy, exchange rate policy is something they don't talk about. And so the two things that could boost the economy, larger deficits, lower value dollar, are both things that they don't talk about. You both keep saying they don't talk about this crucial issue. They don't talk about that crucial issue. They don't take the stand and speak the truth to us. What's going on? I wrote something in 2010. I said that Obama's believes that the response to any policy problem is better propaganda. And unfortunately, I think this is an illustration of that phenomenon. But is it better propaganda to be silent when people can't get jobs, the job growth is down, we need to spend money and they're not doing it? He won in 2012, even with a terrible economy. So it didn't, you know, it didn't seem to, running bad policies didn't seem to prevent him from getting reelected. And the people in positions of power, they're basically doing okay. I mean, the stock market's up, corporate profits are at near record highs. So you know, for the people who are in power, they're doing fine. So I'm not saying that they're all, you know, like evildoers who want no. people to suffer, but, you know, and I, I've been, you know, I'm sure you could turn on the news any day of the week and you'll hear a round table like this. You won't be there. I won't be there. His <laughs> yeah. won't be there. And they'll go, look, we just have to get through a tough time. And invariably the people at the table aren't experiencing a tough time. So it's saying, you know, those tens of millions of people that are either unemployed or partially employed, haven't had a wage increase in years, they're going to have to get through tough times. So there's a real disconnect. The people who are sort of making policy, passing judgment on policy, they're okay. Um, it's all these people around the country that are really suffering who don't really have a voice. Yeah, I think it's even, and I think to amplify that, if you go to Washington, D.C., you know, it's incredibly prosperous. And most D.C. people, to the extent they leave D.C., they come to New York. And if you stay in the better heeled parts, if you stay in Manhattan, things look fine in Manhattan. Now, you have to not look out the t window of the Acela. I mean, if you did, you'd see how bad things are. But, you know, it's very easy to ignore what's happening because, again, as Dean said, it, you know, these people all deal with other people who are basically doing fine, and they don't hear or have much contact with the people who are suffering. Well, this brings us to the upcoming big fight over Social Security and Medicare. The top Republicans are saying repeatedly that they will be glad to end the sequester, the across-the-board federal cuts that took place earlier this year, if Democrats agree to future cuts in Social Security and Medicare. How do you both think this is going to play out? Well, President Obama has indicated he's been willing to make cuts in both Social Security and Medicare, but I think he needs something more in taxes than the Republicans are prepared to give. So my guess is that you won't see that. But it does have me very concerned. These are openly on the table. And you look at the condition of today's elderly, I think you're really hard-pressed to say that they have too much money. I mean, for 40% for of their people, 40% of people over age 65, their Social Security check is more than 90% of their income. And these are checks that average a little over $1,200 a month. So to say that these people are doing so well, we should be looking to cut back their benefits or have them pay more for Medicare, that to my mind seems 180 degrees wrong track. I think to put it more bluntly, uh, no one is willing to talk about the fact that Social Security and Medicare cuts equal having old people die faster. Um, and that the proposals to do that 
are indirect and they've labeled them in technical language so that most people won't realize that's what's happening. I mean, change CPI, you know, that's a my eyes glaze over term. Consumer but that's, price index. Right, and, and so that's the mechanism by which the Social Security is going to be cut, is that, is that the cuts will basically lag the inflation that seniors experience. And yet, I can just show you the headlines. President Obama said the other day the country has to address, quote, long-term obligations that we have around things like Medicare and Social Security. The chair of the Senate Budget Committee, Patty Murray, Democrat from Washington State, says all issues are on the negotiating table. The number two Democrat in the Senate, Dick Durbin, told Fox News on Sunday that Social Security is going to run out of money in 20 years. Medicare may run out of money in 10 years. Let's fix it now. That's Dick Durbin, number two man yeah. in the Senate. I mean, it sounds like Democrats are in a bargaining mood. Absolutely. Um, the one thing we have going for us is the vast majority of people across the country in both political parties are strongly opposed to these cuts. You know, so that, that is the thing they have to overcome. So you get 75, 80 percent of Republicans, Tea Party Republicans, are opposed to cuts to these programs. But just to take the specific points that, you know, uh, Senator Durbin raised, if you look at Social Security, it's gone from being about 4 percent of our economy in 2000 to about 5 percent today. It's projected to be about 6 percent in 20 years. That's because we have an aging population, the baby boomers. We could handle that. That's not a big deal. But when you talk about Medicare, it's a totally different story. That's being driven by our health care costs. We spend more than twice as much per person as the average for other wealthy countries. We have nothing to show for it in terms of outcomes. We have to fix our health care system. So talking about we're going to take this from seniors is totally wrongheaded. Now we can go back to our trade deal and say, okay, let's get lower cost drugs, let's get lower cost doctors. There are things we can do to fix health care. I've been on panels with a lot of these people, they go, oh, but Dean, fixing health care is hard. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were the tough guys. <laughs> There's a piece of this that's even uglier, which is that the, the statistics that everyone relies on, you know, all the people that you quoted, come from the Congressional Budget Office. They're the more, um, skeptical economists who've looked at them have actually found pretty serious problems with their forecasts. That they, even though they're, they are, quote, nonpartisan in terms of not being affiliated with either party, they have, in fact, taken a very deficit hawkish approach to the way they put their numbers together. Um, two economists who are at the Federal Reserve, and they are probably the two most qualified economists in the country, they wrote a paper on the CBO's health care cost forecasts, and they shredded them. So if you were to use these, these Fed economist forecasts, you wouldn't be anywhere near as concerned. You wouldn't have the drive to, quote, fix, end quote, these programs. But I think it's back to Dean's point that it's actually, for, for, for Medicare, it's a reflection of the way we do health care in this country. And the fact that we've got, and we've got a uh, pay for, we, where doctors are paid for services, and therefore they have an incentive to recommend more services. You've also got a population which is trained to think yeah. that more treatment is better. The yeah. desire to intervene quickly, even for things that aren't very serious, is very strong here. Yeah, I, 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 I'd agree with that completely. And just to make a couple points again, Social Security, I think it's just absurd to think of this as a problem. We're aging. I don't think that's a bad thing. I mean, we could all have us die younger, but I don't think people would really think that's a good story. So that's going to cost money. And it does cost more money today than it did 20 or 30 years ago. It's going to cost more money in 20, 30 years from now. If people have normal wage growth, if people got the share, their share of economic gains, we'd be talking about before tax wages 30 years out that are 40 or 50 percent higher than they are today. You know, that, that's not an issue. Now, when it comes to health care, you know, he's exactly right. But the other thing, you know, I think we have to put this in some context. We don't know. And I think you're exactly right that the projections are likely too high. But let's say the Congressional Budget Office projections prove right. I don't think we're going to have morons running the country in 25 years. So if it really is the case that we're looking at these really big health care costs, they will be able to deal with that then. On what basis do you make such a prediction? <laughs> well, the reality, however much I might be critical of Congress and the president, we don't have a history of runaway deficits. As much as they like to say, oh, we, we actually don't, you know, and I, I'd argue they probably did too much. You know, you go back to the Clinton years, you know, they said, oh, we got to uh, balance the budget. And of course, they did. But the idea that we just had exploding deficits that, you know, Congress and the president just looked the other way, we don't have any history of that. Eve, explain this then. It seems that although the facts and argument may be on your side, the politics of it is going in the other direction. Well, there's a very effective messaging apparatus that doesn't include middle class Americans. I think that's what it boils down to, you know, that, 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 the, that the people that the reporters get their information from uh, 
are the ones that significantly push stories. And a very significant percentage of the stories that appear for a very long period of time have always been driven basically by press releases or messaging. And Pew's studies have basically found the same things true now, that half the stories are literally promoted to the media. And then at the other half, inevitably, if you're a journalist, you're going to call some famous person who's legitimate, you know, to get the, the sort of plus and minus. And most of the famous people who are legitimate are, you know, either they're important government officials who are going to be, who are largely on board with the story, or they're going to be business interests. There are unfortunately very small, only very small pockets of people who are considered to be legitimate that a journalist would call to get the other side of the story. We started with free trade. Let's close with free trade. You're on the board of an organization called Just Foreign Policy, and that organization is offering a reward to anyone who can give it a copy of the negotiating text of the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement. Uh, any, any takers so far? Not so far. So the idea here is that we do have people who are involved in the negotiating process. They have access to at least parts of the deal. So the hope is that someone from good conscience, presumably more than you know, the hope of getting a big reward, will feel, you know, feel the urge to make it public and you know, the organization Just Foreign Policy, I'm on the board but I don't play an active role in running it, um, will be happy to then post on the web so that you know, people across the country and really you know, in all the countries will have an opportunity to see it. So in the last word here, both of you, the argument is this Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement will ensure a freer flow of goods and greater prosperity. The other side of it really serves essentially what we know about it, the corporate interest. Is that where you come down? Uh, very much so. I mean, this really is a deal that's being negotiated by corporations for corporations, and any benefit it provides to the bulk of the populations of this country will be purely incidental. There'd be no reason to keep it so secret if it was in the interest of the public. Eve Smith, Dean Baker, thank you very much for being with me. Thanks for having me on. Thank you. During the Republican hearings on the meltdown of Obamacare's website, Representative David McKinley of West Virginia knew what he wanted. I haven't heard one of you apologize to the American public. Are, are apologies not in order? I, I, I just, I've not heard the word, I'm sorry, and apologize. I don't understand why there's not an apology, but I apologize. I haven't heard that from any one of the four of you. He got it. I want to apologize to you that the website has not worked as well as it should. You deserve better. I apologize. Considerate, appropriate, and futile. The apology didn't squelch the partisan tirades or quench the Republican thirst for revenge. Their outrage that the Affordable Care Act, that is Obamacare, even got this far. But it did provoke some of us to wonder, isn't it fair to also expect at least a tiny bit of remorse, just a morsel of apology from the Republicans? As NPR's astute health care reporter Julie Robner reminded us recently, When it became clear that HHS would need more money to build the federal exchange than had been allocated in the original law, Republicans in Congress refused to provide it. So to get it started, officials had to scrape together money from a variety of other offices. This happened back in the 30s, after Congress passed Social Security, but failed to sufficiently fund the board that was supposed to run it. Republican opponents of Obamacare have gone further. After it passed, they stalked it like Jack the Ripper. In the states, through the courts, all the way to the Supreme Court, which, uh-oh, ruled it constitutional. In last year's election, when they lost again. But quit? Never. For Republicans, this has become their Alamo. In July, less than three months before scheduled launch, the Speaker of the House, Republican John Boehner, drew one more line in the sand. Obamacare is bad for America. We're going to do everything we can to make sure that it never happens. And yet, the darn thing survived, despite the administration's own very serious mistakes. As Robner reported, Obama's people naively figured Republican states couldn't resist all that cash coming down from the federal government and would decide to create their own insurance exchanges and expand their Medicaid programs. Not so. Republicans, it seems, have their principles, and health care for poor people is not one of them. Ideology trumped money. Republicans aside, 
Obamacare had its own built-in problem, born of original sin. And some of us have to resist the temptation to say, we told you so. Four years ago, we said the public option in health care, a kind of Medicare for all, would be easier to launch and simpler to operate than the Rube Goldberg contraption that came to be known as Obamacare. Rube Goldberg, for those of you under a certain age, was the fellow who designed machines that made simple tasks much more complicated. Back in 2009, when Obama first became president, polls showed the public option was a popular idea. Lots of Americans were fed up with paying bloated premiums to giant insurance companies that charged us for their plutocratic salaries and excessive profit margins. We wanted an alternative. And once upon a time, so did candidate Barack Obama. Now, if I were designing a system from scratch, I would probably move more in the direction of a single-payer plan. But as president, Obama buckled when conservative Senate Democrats, yes, Democrats, threatened to join Republicans in a filibuster if his plan included a public option. That I'm prepared to vote against moving to the next stage of consideration as long as a government-run public option is included. The biggest pill among those corporate Democrats was industry lapdog Max Baucus of Montana, chairman of the Senate Finance Committee. At one point, Baucus even had advocates thrown out of his hearing. Uh, sorry, give me a order. Give me a recess until the order can be restored. Want a single-payer system. Just, Why do you insist on happening. spending more money when the single-payer would give it to us at the price we're spending now? Still, Obamacare made its way through the gauntlet of mercenary senators, predatory lobbyists, and greedy corporations to become law. Rube Goldberg would have been a very happy man. His principle, why do something simple when it can always be made harder, carried the day. And by the time it became law, the Affordable Care Act was a monstrosity of complexity. Sure enough, on opening day, what the Republicans couldn't accomplish happened anyway. Screens froze, error messages flew, data was corrupted, the system broke down, and Obamacare stalled at the starting gate. Supporters gaped at the wreckage of their best laid plans. Opponents gloated. And Republicans, of course, called hearings, which any opposition party would have done. But you must note the irony here. The party that had thrown roadblock after roadblock wherever they could and had just shut the government down to stop health care reform now loudly complained that government wasn't working and people couldn't get, you guessed it, health care reform. Apologize. And apologize. An apology. Okay, Representative McKinley, you got it. But wouldn't a little humility be in order here? Democracy is imperfect, and we need to work with what we've got, and what we've got is the Affordable Care Act. We also need to remember that at the outset, big ventures often go awry, not just in the public sector. Remember when Apple introduced the iPhone 4 in June of 2010? Uh, we're having a little problem here. Steve Jobs couldn't get it to connect to the Internet. Embarrassing, but they worked it out. When Facebook went public last year, a technical error in NASDAQ system delayed the start of trading, resulting in a loss to market makers of half a billion dollars. And those of you old enough to know who Rube Goldberg was may recall the rollout of the Edsel, a Ford Motor Company automobile. So awful, its name still is synonymous with a costly flop. And let's not talk about Lehman Brothers, Bear Stearns, AIG, J.P. Morgan Chase, the crash of 08. Beside those calamities, Obamacare's computer problems pale. Oh yes, mistakes are made by big corporations and big government. And although I was for something else, something simpler and easier to manage, I'm betting this will get fixed. As for those strident partisan voices crowing over Obamacare's first bad round, ask yourself if those weren't some of the same voices cheering on the invasion of Iraq and promising victory would be swift and easy. Ten years, trillions of dollars, and all those lost and wrecked lives. Have we heard any apology? At our website, BillMoyers.com, learn more about America's secret trade agenda and its impact on you and our economy. 
And remember to join the debate. What would you say to President Obama about the balance between national security and the possible killing of innocent civilians? That's all at BillMoyers.com. I'll see you there, and I'll see you here next time. Don't wait a week to get more Moyers. Visit BillMoyers.com for exclusive blogs, essays, and video features. This episode of Moyers & Company is available on DVD for $19.95. To order, call 1-800-336-1917 or write to the address on your screen. Funding is provided by Carnegie Corporation of New York, celebrating 100 years of philanthropy and committed to doing real and permanent good in the world. The Kohlberg Foundation, Independent Production Fund, with support from the Partridge Foundation, a John and Polly Guth charitable fund. The Clements Foundation, Park Foundation, dedicated to heightening public awareness of critical issues. The Herb Alpert Foundation, supporting organizations whose mission is to promote compassion and creativity in our society. The Bernard and Audrey Rappaport Foundation. The John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation. Committed to building a more just, verdant, and peaceful world. More information at macfound.org. Ann Gumowitz. The Betsy and Jesse Fink Foundation. The HKH Foundation. Barbara G. Fleischman. And by our sole corporate sponsor, Mutual of America designing customized individual and group retirement products. That's why we're your retirement company.